I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. Bill, there are coming some 7,000 migrants moving toward the southern border of the United States. If you're listening to President Trump, you think that they could be, that group could be seated with terrorists. If you're listening to Democrats, you think that that group is trying to escape the horrible situation in Honduras. Um, and there may be a little bit of truth to both sides. But Bill, we're just a couple of days out from a midterm election. And what I really like to focus on in this episode is what you think the ups and potential downsides are for President Trump as he approaches this issue. Well, I'm going to assume that he stops it. You, he well, stops we'll, it in we'll the sense with, of he's going to stop 7,000 people from... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the assumption that he prevents their entry into the United States. And then maybe we'll talk about what happens if he doesn't. So if he prevents their entry into the United States, needless to say, a lot's going to depend on how the actual situation goes down. But I also think that given the quality of our, of our military and the incredible discipline and basic humanity that they have, that they're not going to just open fire on people. I, I'm pretty convinced that there's a way for a couple of guys with machine guns to make it pretty clear that you shouldn't go any further than a certain point without actually shooting anybody. So look, this is not a seepage. This is not a, a drift of civilians. This is a column. It's been um, organized, and it's been organized by people who are not friendly to the United States, both within and without the United States. If this column is allowed to march into the United States of America, then this will be the first of a series of convoys that will never stop. So in terms of what Trump's uh, fallout for this is, if he does stop them, stop them, hopefully, preferably, obviously, nonviolently, or at the very least, non-fatally, um, then it goes to the American people. And the American people's attitude on this, I want to say is about three or four to one in favor of secure borders. So certainly the far left, which owns all the mouthpieces and, and the media will be squawking and, and, and screeching at the top of their lungs about the, the, the you know, the, the Nazi execution squads and SS that Trump sent to the border. But that's one out of five. And I think the other four out of five Americans are going to go pretty much say, yeah, whatever you think about the immigration situation, can't have a column of 7,000 people moving through the country with the express destination of crossing the U.S. border and then allow that to happen and not expect a lot worse things to come after. Well, the impression you get from reading accounts of the uh, the marchers themselves, these this migrant caravan, as it's been dubbed by the media, is that they're not trying to come barging across the border for the most part, although some of them did uh, wade across the river going from Honduras to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from Guatemala into Mexico. Um, but Bill, it, a lot of them basically said, look, Honduras is a cesspit of drugs, poverty, and crime, and we're trying to escape that. Not only that, Bill, but there are a lot of these people who actually used to live in the United States and got deported, and some of them have children here. Some of them were working jobs here. Many of them were, of course, sending money back to, to Honduras. These are very sympathetic characters to the American public, including many children. So you went right to the answer that President Trump seems to be priming us for, which is, oh, my goodness, there may be some terrorists among them, or at very least, these people are breaking the law, so we must stop them. But I don't think that's the question, if whether he's going to stop them. The question is, how does he handle this whole crisis in a way that doesn't make him look like a monster and it is positive when you go into this election? Well, first of all, let's just get something straight right off the bat. They're going to make him look like a monster no matter what happens. Whether he, whether he invites them in with a, with a red carpet, that'll be cruelty to those that came before or after. I guarantee you that he's going to be a monster regardless of the outcome. So if we haven't understood that yet, then we're probably not paying enough attention. And this is why Donald Trump is president, why he's getting things done. He knows how they're going to paint him, and he either doesn't care or he doesn't care enough so that it stops him from doing it. So... I personally think that this argument about the terrorists is, is, a, is a bad argument to make because to me, it's a bit like the weapons of mass destruction argument. Um, if you don't find any terrorists in the column, if you put all your marbles on the terrorist thing, then you're, you know, you're left holding the bag. And it's not about terrorists, although certainly that's a part of it. The actual question is, do we have a border, yes or no? And, and the answer is going to be determined by whether or not these people walk into the United States or whether they don't. Now, as far as all the hardship cases, I don't mean to be uh, you know, flip when I say hardship cases, because some of them really are hardship cases. A number of people, were, if you've been deported during the, during the last 10, 15 years, certainly the last 10 years, 
it's almost certainly because of some kind of crime or something, Scotty. The, I, you know, the uh, immigration under Barack Obama did not go kicking down doors, checking people's papers, and under under Trump either, for that matter. So you have to ask yourself if there are a lot of people that used to live here who are coming back and they would say they were deported. Why were they deported? I want to know why. Not a case by pa case basis. And then, but we, all of this is skirting the main issue. And the main, and I'll get to how Trump resolves it. But the main issue is this. People are fleeing Venezuela and going to Honduras because Venezuela is a hellhole where socialism has turned that from one of the richest countries in the Western Hemisphere to the poorest, and they don't even have pets to eat anymore. The Venezuelans fleeing um, socialism in Venezuela go to Honduras, where they find uh, essentially a lawless non-state. I think it was Honduras that has the highest murder rate uh, of, any, of any country in the world per capita. So now both sets of those people are fleeing into Mexico, which is essentially a failed state that's, that's fully capable of becoming a first world country in terms of its human and its natural resources. And every time that this little frog jumps across another stone, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the problem is that they're the problem. And this is never going to go away until they're not the problem. You're never going to be able to deal with the issue of immigration, illegal immigration into America. You can do, do the wall thing. And look, I've said it a hundred times, needs to be said a thousand times. The reason we need a wall is because the progressives wouldn't let us have a border. Okay, if they're not going to enforce the border, then we need a wall. Now, the issue and, and the drive is not going to go away until Mexico becomes the kind of place that people aren't desperate to escape. Well, that's a great, a great point, Bill, because I guess one might wonder, what is the appropriate American geopolitical strategy for dealing with this thing? And I think you're correct in that you've got to deal with it upstream. You don't wait till people show up at your border and say, gee, why are you trying to escape your failed state? Um, this is our hemisphere. We pay a lot of attention to immigrants that are flooding into Europe, for example, co coming from the Muslim world and, and crossing uh, the Mediterranean. And yet here we have a number of what you might call failed states or, or almost third world countries just south of the United States. And I haven't really heard a Republican who's able to elucidate any kind of a, a strategy for how to deal with that to nip this in the bud upstream, so to speak. Well, I haven't given it any thought prior to now, but here's a Republican who has a, who has a thought or two on this issue, sort of. It, it can't be any worse than what I've heard so far. <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, First of all, the border with Mexico is the biggest strategic in interest that the United States of America has. The border with Mexico makes Iraq, Afghanistan, all of this pales in significance to the border between the United States and Mexico. So imagine a world where the border between the United States and Mexico is essentially the same as the border between the United States and Canada. And then think about how the world looks and think about how this country looks. And for those of you who've ever played Risk, Think about how it looks to have armies down on the on the and the peninsula up in Newfoundland and out on uh, Alaska. You basically have a North American fortress of prosperity if you can get Mexico into the game. If you don't get Mexico into the game, then Mexico becomes a dispersal of the funnel that comes right up through all of South America. Central America goes right through the isthmus there in Panama and just keeps going north and keeps coming. And you get MS-13 and you get all the rest of this uh, pathologies along with people that are looking for work. And here's the main problem. The main problem is, is that the people who have, who are generally speaking, making these voyages are the ones who are most likely to take a risk. They're the ones that are most likely to um, be uh, discontented with, with the current situations. In other words, they're probably the best people that, that these countries have. I really mean it. It's certainly how America was settled. We can't just allow everybody in the world to walk across our borders. But if I was Donald Trump, here's what I would be doing, Scott. I would start thinking very seriously about a private enterprise mega deal. And when I say a mega deal, I mean, I would combine American capital with Mexican labor and I would put the Chinese out of business. Fascinating. And that's a proposal. At least we have something here, ladies and gentlemen. It's a proposal. Um, and, yeah. and it's a win, win, win proposal because we're not, we're not stopping people because they're not having to walk through the desert. They're not being forced to bring in these kilograms of cocaine. They're not being raped out in the desert in, in, in vast numbers. They're not subject to these coyotes. They're not dying in vans. And the reason they're not dying getting into America is because Mexico is no longer a place that you would die to get out of. Life in Mexico could certainly be prosperous enough so that any one of their citizens should be perfectly happy to stay there. 
And, you know, if the Democrats get back in power, it probably won't be long before it's Americans crawling over the wall to get to Mexico. If they stop putting, if they would just stop with this bloody socialism. So the issue is the socialism. The socialism is due to the corruption. The corruption is due to the lack of rule of law. And therein lies your problem right there. Well, and a lot of the uh, right wing media, if you want to call it that, really opinion sites and, and social media uh, amplification of, of tweets um, are sending out this message that basically these people aren't marching north from Honduras. They're occasionally appearing before the cameras marching and then they pile into trucks and buses and they get carted forward because they frankly couldn't make a walk that far in the time that they're projecting to do this. What does that tell so, you? What I'm, the point I'm getting to is they say, well, basically George Soros or somebody like that is funding this effort and it's all been staged, timed to meet the U.S. elections on November 6th uh, for the crisis to peak just before the U.S. election. Do you think that, that Democrats have, if they're behind something like this, have really misplayed their hand in this and have actually handed Donald Trump his favorite issue in the world? You would think they wouldn't be that stupid, but you'd also think they wouldn't be stupid enough to accuse a man of, of uh, rape without being able to remember the day, year, location, time, and having all of your friends who said would back up your story deny the story. You'd think they would be smart enough not to try that either, but they did. So I want to make it clear when you said, do I think Democrats? I think progressives, yes, the progressives that have taken over the Democratic Party. And I'm not trying to get the Democratic Party off the hook here. I'm just saying that the progressives and these Marxists have taken the leadership of the Democratic Party, Barack Obama and, and people like, you know, all, all of them. Uh, Hillary Clinton with this progressivism and all. Well, she's mostly about her own progress, but you get the idea. <laughs> so it is entirely possible. In fact, I think it's likely that they are so deep in their own echo chamber that they think because all they do is watch the media with their friends and froth at the mouth at the same cocktail parties as everybody else. They think that Americans are going to react the same way, which is, oh my God, when, when, when America sees tanks on the border, keeping out poor campesinos and children, then Trump is finished. And I think if America sees tanks on the border, keeping out poor campesinos and children, then Trump is reelected. And uh, the Republicans sweep this November. That's what I think. Bill Whittle now provides Bill's daily hot takes five days a week uh, for the members or from the members actually at BillWhittle.com and for the world. If you'd like to join them and become a distributor, a citizen producer of this kind of content, you can go to BillWhittle.com and click that subscribe button. It's just $9.95 a month. In the meantime, we're going to make some more of these episodes because we've been hearing from a lot of our viewers that they're loving this, Bill. And I don't know if you got a chance to read many of the comments. You're usually so busy doing research and preparing for things. But the response that we're getting to Bill Whittle now has really been terrific. Well, it, it has been. In, and a couple of people said they're not as good as the firewalls or the afterburners. And I, there's a case to be made for that. But once I've, I've done 400 of these, I think 300 something. And uh, I think it's time to stop laying out the foundational principles and start applying those principles to day to day combat in terms of what we're seeing in the news. That's the whole idea of what we're trying to do now. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making this possible.